I'm the sea level rise adaptation planning um, planner for this project. This is a multi-phase, multi-year project that the State Coastal Conservancy has uh, started funding in uh, 2010. So. And uh, we have a planning working group that we put together. And the focus of this planning uh, effort on Humboldt Bay um, is to bring into the, the local coastal program uh, planning authorities, the city of Eureka, the city of Arcata, Humboldt County, and the Coastal Commission to form the core of this group, because um, all of them are going to have to deal with issues on Humboldt Bay together. And we also brought in some of the other uh, land management agencies that have a connection to Humboldt Bay and are interested in um, how the existing vulnerabilities in LC level rise might play out. Okay. You want me to do this or? Okay. And the reason why is this map illustrates we have overlapping jurisdictions. Uh, we have the jurisdictions of each of the cities, and then we have a, a, um, a comprehensive uh, jurisdiction that's held by the Coastal Commission. It's the retained lands, the public trust lands around Humboldt Bay. So if you have a project that you're trying to work on uh, and address uh, shoreline conditions, you could end up needing to get multiple coastal development plans or uh, permits in order to go forward with the project. So trying to integrate planning at a regional level so that we don't end up with four different strategies on how to address sea level rise was uh, the incentive for putting this together. So the, the, the entire purpose or the goal of the project is really to support informed decision making around Humboldt Bay with the various land use authorities who are ultimately going to have to update their local coastal programs and their general plans and develop uh, implementation strategies. If we can support that in, and make it consistent on a region-wide basis, then we'd consider ourselves uh, successful. So for um, adaptation planning for sea level rise, it's not really much different than uh, uh, the planning process that you go through for uh, hazard mitigation planning and others. We need to assess what are the existing conditions, identify uh, where the exposures are, what assets are at risk, and then uh, develop and plan for ways to mitigate or modify or adjust to those impacts. And then ultimately you need to implement uh, your planning strategy. And that's what we're going through. And in order to help us with this process, uh, we're relying on um, uh, climate change guidelines that were issued by the state of California last year, as well as another planning document that was issued by Cal Energy. We're waiting for a uh, sea level rise uh, uh, planning guidance document to be released by the Coastal Commission. It's been in the works for the last year or so. It's still not out. We're hoping that it will be compatible with the guidelines that are already out so we don't have to change our process in midstream. So. so the first phase of the project was to figure out what are the existing conditions on Humboldt Bay uh, to identify what's uh, vulnerable and what's at risk. And surprisingly, Humboldt Bay had never been inventoried or mapped to the shoreline. We didn't know where the dikes were. We didn't know how many miles of dikes we had. We didn't know who owned the dikes on the bay. And so that was one of the first things that we set out to do. And this photograph is a, is a good illustration of what one and a quarter feet of sea level rise looks like on Humboldt Bay. This is the, the Wiat Tribe's World Renewal Ceremonial Site, uh, Tolowat Village on Indian Island. And this is during a king high tide in 2010, it was in December. Our mean base elevation that we are using to measure sea level rise from is the mean monthly maximum high tide, which is about 7.74 feet at the tide gauge. Here's uh, a king high tide that's about 1.2 feet higher. And you can see in the case of the, the Wiyad village site, which is a shell midden, uh, there's not much freeboard above that level of, um, of rise. So on an annual basis, we experience one to two feet of sea level rise during king high tide and storm surges or if we have El Nino. So we're able to we started a program of going around photographing Humboldt Bay during these king high tides just to illustrate what is vulnerable and uh, what the landscape looked like. So the second phase of the project is doing a vulnerability assessment uh, for, uh, around the bay and then developing adaptation planning strategies. And um, 
So let's show you what uh, we came up with in phase one. If you look at historic conditions on Humboldt Bay, and that's a good place to start if you're trying to figure out what's vulnerable to flooding around Humboldt Bay. On this uh, air photograph, the, air, the blue line that you see, that was the salt marsh tidal boundary uh, naturally occurring before we started modifying the shoreline. That's where it was in 1870. There was about 60% uh, of the bay was composed of open water and mud flat and 40% salt marsh, and its shoreline was about 60 miles long. Today, about 90% of the bay is composed of open water and mud flat, and only 10% of the salt marsh is there. We lost about 8,000 acres of salt marsh, and we now have 102 miles of shoreline. And the reason that's important is that 77 miles of that 102 miles are artificial. It was a shoreline that was built for a purpose. It's a shoreline that needs to be maintained, and if it's not maintained, it could fail and put at jeopardy those lands that are being protected by that. So that's an awful lot of land on Humboldt Bay that needs to be, or a lot of shoreline. And on Humboldt Bay, unlike the Central Valley, we don't have a reclamation district. There's no one agency that is responsible for the management and the maintenance of the shoreline dikes and structures. It's left to every property owner on their own. So when we did our shoreline inventory, um, I traversed the entire 102 miles of Humboldt Bay in this project. And essentially 67% of the shoreline is made up of two structures of the artificial shoreline. It's earthen dikes that were uh, built in the 1880s, 1890s, and railroad, which was built around 1910 to 1920. Those two structures are both linear, have a uniform elevation, and they dominate the shoreline on Humboldt Bay. And that's significant uh, when we look later at the vulnerability on the bay. When we looked at the conditions of that shoreline, only a third of the artificial shoreline is actually fortified or armored. The other two-thirds are either vegetated or, as this shows, about nine miles or 10% of it is actively eroding today. We uh, used a, a new LIDAR that was released in 2012, and we created a shoreline elevation profile. So we know the elevation of the entire 102 miles every meter we've taken an elevation. And we've compared that elevation to our base tidal elevation, which is the mean monthly uh, high tide that's experienced on, on Humboldt Bay. And we identified how high above or below that base elevation is the shoreline. So we were able to find out where we have low-lying shore and where we don't. So the second phase of the project is uh, doing the vulnerability uh, assessment and starting the adaptation planning process. And on Humboldt Bay, what we're really facing as uh, the hazard or the impact that we're all concerned about is really flooding. And flooding as it's manifest either by shoreline failure of eroding or shoreline overtopping or ground subsidence, rising groundwater. Uh, all of those elements are, lead to the same uh, conclusion of flooding. So. So in phase two, we're going to generate um, an inventory and map of the entire shoreline so we know what's out there, the structures. We uh, uh, generated a vulnerability rating of the entire shoreline so we know where we have highly vulnerable shoreline and moderately and low. We're in the process of generating inundation maps uh, that are for existing water elevations and for three or four elevation uh, scenarios with sea level rise, one, two, and three, and six feet. We're also modeling groundwater elevations to see how groundwater is going to respond to rising uh, sea levels. All of those four products are GIS databases that we're making available to everybody that uh, is working on Humboldt Bay. And we've uh, selected four case studies that we want to run through the risk assessment process and the adaptation strategy process uh, on Humboldt Bay. And we are going to be holding uh, annual public and stakeholder meeting. We're looking at our first one possibly in November. Uh, we've completed the first inundation model map uh, of existing conditions. And we think it's important to share that with the public so we can see what is it we're really up against and what we're facing. So, so these are the products that we're uh, generating. And in dealing with um, flooding issues and, and sea level rise on Humboldt Bay, I'm really not that worried about sea level rise. I'm worried about today. I'm worried about the existing conditions. This is another king tide. It was almost nine feet, which was about almost one and a quarter to one and a half feet above our base elevation. This is down by Elk River Slough and Martin and Swain Slough. So we have saltwater flooding occurring now around Humboldt Bay during the King High Tides events. And we haven't had an El Nino in a while. 
and that raises water elevation by a foot for several months. So the process that we've uh, selected or, or modified from what the state published uh, so that it's more appropriate to Humboldt Bay is we want to find out what lands are at risk or that are exposed or vulnerable, where are they? Then once we've identified where are those lands that would be at risk, we want to know what is on those lands, what assets might be threatened by flooding and failure. And then uh, we're looking at how is the impacts going to be manifest? Is it really rising groundwater that we're, we should be most concerned about or is it uh, fetch and shoreline erosion or wave run up? Uh, we're basically looking at different ways that flooding may occur around Humboldt Bay. And then once we identify what's at risk and how it might be exposed through the impacts, an important thing is to figure out what is it that we can do about it. Um, you know, who has the ability, what jurisdiction would be able to respond to the issue to help mitigate it or modify for it. And also, what is the resiliency of the asset that's at risk? Can it be modified so that it's a little more resistant to the impact? So, this is a way of helping us get to the point of prioritizing what assets do we need to address first because we won't be able to address all of them at the same time. So the next step is trying to figure out how soon are these impacts going to start happening. And as you saw with the earlier slides, we're already having tidewater flooding. And the incidence of uh, tides, or king tides over nine feet seem to be increasing you know, for the last decade. So we, the urgency, I would argue, is now. We don't need to wait for changes in sea level rise. And then lastly, um, looking at the economic value of the, of the assets, what is, uh, that will help us with prioritization of what we uh, will address. So where are we vulnerable? We did our mapping, our shoreline mapping on the left. We know where dikes are exposed and are ready to breach. We know where dikes on the right are of low elevation and ready to be uh, over top. The area in shaded in blue is what was inundated naturally before the dikes were built. So those are the lands that are vulnerable right now. And whatever is on those lands or the uses of those lands are the risks that's at, uh, that is vulnerable. So in looking at the entire shoreline, we established the vulnerability rating for the whole shoreline. And 60 mi 59 miles of it is rated as highly vulnerable, which means either it's actively eroding or it's of low elevation. It's within two feet of our base tidal elevation. So in the assessment modeling that we're doing right now, we created a tidal record uh, from Crescent City's tide gauge because the ocean off the coast is not much different from Crescent City to here. So we have a, a record to figure out what the recurrence is of some of these major events. We're modeling, in, in, coming up with inundation models so we know specifically almost parcel to parcel which areas would be at risk. And we're looking at groundwater modeling to see which areas would be at flooding. So here's the inundation model uh, under existing conditions. This is assuming you know, the shoreline, the dikes, the railroads aren't there to hold back the salt water. If they weren't there, what land would be flooded? And you can see um, the line in black, the border in black, that's where the, the tide water went to before we diked it. And coincidentally, if the dikes weren't there, the area, the footprint of inundation hasn't expanded that much. It has in some areas, particularly in the Elk Valley uh, Elk River Valley area it's significantly expanded in that area. And we think that's possibly due to subsidence. So this is uh, one of the products that we want to share with the public so they can just see where is the vulnerability and risk now. We're not talking about one or two or three feet of sea level rise. We're talking about today. What is that risk if the shoreline breaches? And we uh, developed some recurrence interval on major floods. I think the thing that's important to realize here is that you can see the 100-year uh, flood elevation on the red line. It's um, over right here. And it was 18 inches of sea level rise. That 100-year recurrence uh, flood event all of a sudden becomes the new king tide. We're not looking at a tremendous amount of sea level rise to have a lot of impact on Humboldt Bay. Uh, just half a meter would be significant. And so we're looking now at what is at risk. And so we looked at critical assets. And we decided to select, as I said, case studies to walk our, our, through the process. And we wanted those case studies to be within each of the local coastal program uh, authorities and one that traversed multiple authorities to see how agencies would have to work together. So we selected King Salmon in the county's jurisdiction and the wastewater treatment facilities in the city of Arcadia and Eureka because they're certainly critical 
and then the 101 corridor uh, from the entire length of Humboldt Bay traverses multiple uh, jurisdictions. So these are the things that we're going to develop risk assessments for and try to develop adaptation strategies. This is King Salmon. It's our Venice on Humboldt Bay. Here's the 101 railroad and, and uh, highway corridor. The railroad's higher than 101 in this location, and you can see pickle weeds growing through the, the railroad. So other assets that would be of interest you know, to these jurisdictions to finally assess are, are multiple and would be quite time consuming. That's why we selected case studies. So, so the way that sea level rise or the uh, impacts are, we think are going to manifest are going to be through ground, uh, through flooding, either through breaching or overtopping or rising groundwater. And I believe rising groundwater may prove to be our biggest risk. And it's already happening uh, during the King Tide Hyde events. Uh, this is 2003. Here we had almost um, one and three quarters feet of sea level rise during this event. And this was on uh, one of the sloughs. It breached 240 feet of dike. It stayed flooded for a couple of years. It was only because FEMA brought in $11 million after Katrina to reinforce uh, the dikes on Arcata Bay that this breach got patched, otherwise it probably would not have been fixed or repaired. We had another king tide event about the same magnitude. You can see there's no freeboard in the dikes. The tide's right up at the surface. This was the New Year Eve king tide and storm surge. And this is what um, we were dealing with in many of the agricultural areas that are behind the dikes that uh, are on former tide lands is during the winter when we have a lot of precipitation and a lot of runoff, these areas are saturated because the groundwater is coming up. So in a way, we can spend millions of dollars fortifying the, the shoreline. And if we turn around and we look at the rising groundwater, the land use that we were protecting with that investment is lost because of the rising groundwater and vegetative conversion. So fortification in structures may not always be the, the solution, at least not dealing with flooding. So adaptive uh, capacities to respond. What tools do jurisdictions really have to help uh, deal with this? Obviously, the local coastal program policies and regulations, changes in zoning to affect future development. Always there's an engineering solution of building a structure or, or reinforcing a structure. Uh, using natural systems on shorelines uh, to prevent erosion and the failure of those shorelines rather than using rock and armament. And then obviously, uh, public education and awareness is really a big one so people realize where the risks are and what's vulnerable. But lastly, can we afford to deal with this? Do we have the financial ability to address this? We have problems with our capital improvement programs uh, without being threatened by hazards such as this. So I'm not sure where the money is going to come from. And uh, next is how urgent is this? And I would argue it's already here. We're already dealing with it. These are the, the maximum high tide of every year since 1977 on Humboldt Bay. And since 2000, we were having many more of our maximum high tides are over nine feet in elevation. And so we're seeing a change and an increase in the height of these uh, high tides. And you could argue that that sea level rise in motion or you could argue that it's actually the ground is dropping. There's relative sea level. You have the ocean going up, but you need to know what is the ground doing? Is the ground stable and, uh, or is it rising or is it dropping? In the case of Humboldt Bay, it appears to be dropping. And uh, if you look at the rate of elevation change uh, up and down the coast at all the tide gauges, Humboldt Bay happens to have the greatest rate of change anywhere on the west coast. And the, it's not the ocean. The ocean's have risen maybe about eight inches in a century, but we have an additional 10 and a half inches of drop, and that's the ground that's been dropping. So um, I think that we have, we're at a tipping point on Humboldt Bay that if water elevation changes between two to three feet, most of the shoreline structure is over top, and that could occur from subsidence. And so lastly, the economic consequences, that would help us determine what areas do we want to focus on first, what areas really can we offer a solution. It's pretty hard to combat rising groundwater. Um, that's one thing that we're not going to be able to do on eight or 9,000 acres of agricultural land. 
And then lastly, we'll be involved with developing adaptation strategies so that these uh, land use authorities can modify their coastal programs. One of the strategies we learned early on is, is that you can't do this parcel by parcel, and you can't do it jurisdiction by jurisdiction. We need to look at the entirety of Humboldt Bay. We need to look at each of the hydrologic units that are uh, integral to itself. There's six of those on Humboldt Bay. Here we have a landowner that's invested time, money, and permitting and materials to fortify his shoreline and his neighbor hasn't. And when his neighbor's property fails, they both flood. That's the same thing on the jurisdictional level with cities and counties. We're all in this together. We need to do this as a regional exercise. And that's what we've been doing with this project. And so lastly, the strategies for addressing sea level rise or the flood hazard that we have on Humboldt Bay are the same things that you use to determine what do these jurisdictions have in order to adapt the uh, same type of tools, land use and regulations, policy, structural engineering solutions, natural systems, and education. And um, this is what it could cost us uh, to, uh, per mile to fortify our shorelines. And as you remember, I said there's 77 miles of artificial shoreline on Humboldt Bay. And if you look at the value of what's being protected by the structure, you really have to balance the economic value. Agricultural land that has a certain number of animal units is much different than a city's wastewater treatment facility. So. And lastly, uh, finishing up, is that what we're doing is really not new. I mean, it's called hazard mitigation planning, uh, dealing with 100-year flood events, tsunami run-up zones. These are the zones that are at risk right now under those two hazards. And if you look at two meters of sea level rise on Humboldt Bay, we're essentially talking about the same footprint, the same geography. What's different is a hazard and in hazard mitigation planning, the assumption or the expectation at some point you're going to get over that hazard and you'll be able to restore whatever uses and functions you had before the hazard. With sea level rise and those type of changes, whether it's through ground subsidence or the ocean actually rising, I don't expect we're going to be getting over anytime soon. It's more how are we going to adapt to them. And that's it. Thank you.